Thank you uh, for joining our, our seminar uh, this time. So this is the TCBG uh, uh, research seminar, and we're going to be presenting by uh, Dr. Stacy Prowl from uh, Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, Stacy's been at Oak Ridge for about five years or so now. Um, he wears many different hats there, but uh, but today he's going to talk about enabling insecurity. So uh, with that, let's welcome uh, Dr. Stacy Prowl. Thanks. Uh, so we'll see if this works now. <laughs> so I'm going to talk. Uh, thank you all for coming today. I'm getting on the cold day to come over here to, to listen to me talk, which I can assure you won't be that rewarding. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about enabling and security. So I'm the chief cybersecurity research scientist at Oak Ridge. Uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory is the Department of Energy Laboratory. You may be a little confused as to what the Department of Energy is doing in this, in this area. Uh, DOE, among its many different roles, one of them is that it is the, uh, one of the largest funders of basic and applied uh, research in the United States. And a lot of that, I mean, they have, there's a lot of critical infrastructure in the power grid, there's a lot of critical infrastructure, oil and gas, et cetera. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of passwords that have to be entered in things. Um, I don't know what this is for. There we go. Nothing else bad will happen. Uh, <coughs> And so DOE has a lot of interest in that as well, and they've, they've, uh, we have quite a bit of, of, uh, of effort at the lab. The Oak Ridge National Laboratory has, a, has you know, quite a name for itself in terms of computation. The, the Titan uh, supercomputer is there. The National Center for Supercomputing is there. Material science, they have a huge material science department. Uh, but we do, in fact, have a cybersecurity research group there. It's about 35 people, uh, and we do a variety of different types of research from, from authentication and communications, uh, uh, security, communi security communications work, to embedded device security. Uh, we have a Center for Trustworthy Embedded Systems that does a lot of work for uh, uh, determining the security properties of embedded devices, medical devices, uh, infrastructure. And we do quite a bit of work on static analysis of malware, et cetera. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about uh, some of the benefits of using a lot of the technology developed for the IT realm on things like critical infrastructure. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of things that you can do now because we're, we're bringing that technology in-house and we're providing a lot of opportunities for a lot of mischief. And as a framing device for that, I'm going to pick on, on uh, Stuxnet, which you're probably, I imagine, one or two of you may have heard of in passing. So I'm going to pick a little bit on Stuxnet uh, to, to frame that and show you how hopefully you'll come away with the knowledge that you too could have written something like Stuxnet if you were just you know, a little bit more motivated. And once again, I've discovered I can't advance slides. This is not going well. There we go. So a quick timeline of Stuxnet for those of you who, who don't remember all this. Uh, before Stuxnet, a lot was going on in the world. Uh, <coughs> back in uh, April of 2008, uh, there was a, this fellow posted a password. Uh, it was hard-coded into the Siemens, the, sorry, sorry, it's German, Siemens uh, Step 7 systems. And it was used for the, for the back-end uh, SQL database. And so a lot of folks uh, who had noticed this questioned, what do we do about this? And the answer was, well, whatever you do, don't change it because it'll break stuff. There's stuff that depends on this hard-coded password being present. And so they warned not to change it. Uh, then uh, in no by November, several months later, uh, the National SCADA testbed had uh, issued a report on common vulnerabilities. So they did a number of, number of tests on a variety of different devices and uh, a number of assessments, and they had listed among them three key vulnerabilities, and so keep that in mind. Then in, uh, a little few days later, on the 20th, a Trojan was out there that was using this, this link vulnerability in Windows Explorer uh, to get things to run. And so that's out there in the world. And then in April of 2009, uh, this little uh, uh, web magazine, Hacking, hacking uh, expose the Windows print spooler vulnerability. So all this stuff is out in the world. There's hard-coded passwords, there's vulnerabilities in these SCADA systems, uh, uh, there's this link vulnerability. And you can see some of that over here. So here's the, here's the post where the fellow posted the, the login and the password. You can tell it's, a, it's not a US site. And here's some of the, okay, control system protocol, weak integrity checks, clear text authentication, Weak authentication, no password required. So this is a this is a good place if you wanted to get started writing something like this. This would be good places to go to get the information that you would need uh, to begin to build this stuff. And it was all out there. 
So exploits, there are, what about these exploits that are out there in the world? Well, uh, there were four of them that were of interest uh, to us here. Uh, if you want to know how to do them, it turns out that's quite easy. You've got uh, links uh, to videos on YouTube that will, that will show you how to go about setting up Metasploit uh, to exercise each one of these vulnerabilities. It's a, it's a great way to, to, you know, to, to learn how to use these exploits to uh, compromise uh, systems. And there were security bulletins out at the time uh, for a couple of these. And so people knew about a few of these because they've been watching the security uh, bulletins. So, after all of this was out there in the world, around 4.30 p.m. as best we can tell, on uh, June 22nd of 2009, Stuxnet got compiled. Someone somewhere compiled it, and that's the time signature that's left over. And about 12 hours later, it infected the first machine. Uh, it doesn't use the Siemens uh, or the link vulnerabilities at this time. It's just out there uh, with the, the few little bits that it has doing its work. In January of 2010, it gets signed. So uh, a valid uh, certificate is used to sign it. And then later on in May, version two of Stuxnet with all the exploits we've talked about and its digital signature is then released into the world. So it takes a little while, June 2010, uh, it gets discovered. It gets discovered on a machine uh, in Iran. And then in July, it becomes public knowledge. Brian Krabs uh, writes an article about it. Uh, that's kind of an interesting story because uh, the article gets written and it's going to come out, and then there's this denial of service attack that prevents it from coming out that day, uh, so it gets delayed a little bit. <coughs> it was signed with, uh, it's in on the same day, a new version comes out that's been signed with JMicron certificate since the real tech one has expired. And so another new, another real certificate is used to sign it. August, Semantic reveals that it injects the code into program lo programmable logic controllers. So it's, it's, it's clear by now to everybody that it's, uh, it's being used uh, for sabotage. For a while, a uh, few folks argued that no, this is sort of hysteria, it's not being used for sabotage, but by this point it's become clear that that's the purpose of it. And then in November, uh, the head of the uh, Iran's Atomic Energy Organization reports that uh, Western has sent a virus to our country's nuclear sites. We discovered it because of our vigilance. We prevented it from doing any harm. Uh, we now know that it, it actually did a fair amount of harm. Uh, I put the MIT PhD in there just to point out that, you know, uh, an American college degree is still a great way to advance your career, uh, so stay in school. I have to say that at least once during every uh, discussion. <coughs> and that brings us to the end of the story. Uh, 24 June 2012 is the date that was hard-coded in the Stuxnet to self-destruct. It's gone from the world, no, never more uh, to be seen. Uh, but of course, there's been some development since then. People have come along and found early, what they think are earlier versions of it. Uh, uh, just, uh, I guess last week, uh, Iran announced they think they have a new version of it attacking them. And, uh, <laughs> and Tom Bumgarner claims to have found evidence uh, of Stuxnet and Dooku uh, back as far as 2006, and the current claim is that, uh, uh, and he still, I think, says this, that it's, he believes it's linked to Configure. So if you remember Configure, uh, this big thing that went around the world but nobody knew what it was for, uh, the Configure working group would, would monitor it and map it for you. You can see these beautiful maps of it uh, as it spread around the world. Uh, uh, the, uh, his claim is right now that that was a part of the, the early reconnaissance for it. And if you happen to be uh, uh, following the news, uh, the question is who built Stuxnet and wh for what purpose did they build it and, and who deployed it and where did it come from? Well, if you, uh, if you read the New York Times, uh, you may have seen this. The claim is, of course, that, uh, that it was us, the United States, who uh, in, in league with a few other countries that designed and built this. And here's a neat little graphic. This shows that everybody should have the New York Times graphics department at the disposal uh, of how this, how this program may have worked. Uh, of course, there's been no official word either way, and there probably never will be. Uh, but it's clear that you know, somebody with some resources and time uh, built this and put it out in the world. <coughs> there have been some others since then. On uh, September 1st, Dooku was reported. So named because it leaves these tilde DQ files lying around, littering uh, your file space. And then in, uh, in May, 
the world became aware of the of flame, which is kind of a neat thing because of its size. It's 20 megabytes of stuff. It contains, uh, it contains a database, it contains uh, a virtual machine, there's a whole bunch of just stuff thrown in there. It's kind of the kitchen sink of, uh, of malware. <coughs> spreads in a variety of ways, spreads by USB and network, which is, is somewhat unusual. Most malware doesn't have multiple uh, uh, paths to spread. It records audio, keyboards, screenshots, and Skype, so it's probably recording us right now as I talk, so hello. Uh, it does Bluetooth beaconing, which is kind of a neat thing, so if you happen to have your, your phone and your iPad connected up to your machine by Bluetooth, it'll go out there and, and see if it can grab data. And, uh, and it's, it, was, it signed itself. Uh, MD5 is known to have some, some weaknesses, and some older certificate systems out there uh, allow you to use that as a way to, uh, to uh, uh, show the uh, uh, correctness of your certificate, so you can create your own certificate using MD5 collision and self-sign. And then uh, I put this up because, not because it shows the same level of, so this, this is, all this stuff up to here is it's pretty sophisticated stuff. It's getting more sophisticated. They're using high-level languages like Lua to do this work. Uh, very sophisticated, trying to be very stealthy, uh, all this sort of stuff. You don't have to do that. Uh, in, uh, in August 2012, uh, the Shamoon attack erased 30,000 Saudi Ramco workstations. A huge amount of effort was required to clean this up, and this was not at all sophisticated. This was an attack on critical infrastructure that was pretty dumb in its implementation and its deployment, uh, but still very, very effective. So we have, we have two, uh, two cases here. We have the, the Stuxnet case, uh, destructive but quiet and contained and very sophisticated and then this one very destructive and uh, and very noisy and not terribly sophisticated so there's a lot of opportunities out there in the world to do some do some harm and you can find a lot of that stuff out on the internet if you're just motivated enough to go go and look for it so I've asked a lot of people why they feel Stuxnet's interesting why is this of interest to you what do you think about Stuxnet and these are the answers that I got back from different people that I, that I had talked to. Uh, uh, one fellow told me, well, it had eight different propagation methods, and that's really bizarre. You know, to build eight different ways of, of spreading yourself into a piece of malware is really unusual. Uh, zero day exploits, a lot of people told me that it was, an, it was remarkable because of the number of zero days that we used. It's like they just threw the kitchen sink at it. Having one is gold. Having two is just amazing. Having four and just using them all, that's just that's just pathological. Uh, use stolen digital certificates. That's a pretty neat, neat uh, property. Cross the air gap. It used replay. It would record, I think, the first 21 seconds of telemetry, and it would play that back in a loop. So if you were watching the telemetry, it looked like, it looked like nothing was changing and things were going on just perfectly normally, when in fact it was changing a lot of things behind the scenes. Uh, used a root kit to hide on affected computers. Eh, okay. Uh, it infected the step seven project files. So it would, it would actually put itself in the files. It uh, replaced one of the DLLs, and it would do this nice little pass-through. So you would write the code onto the PLC, and as, it, as the code went out, it would add the, pay, add the malicious payload to it and put it on there. If you read it back, if you found out something's wrong with this PLC, I want to see what's on it. You read the code off of it. Your infected machine would read that code off, extract the bad stuff, and just show you the good stuff. So that's kind of a neat little uh, property. Modified PLC code, uh, a few folks told me that the thing that uh, was most interesting about it was that all of this together is a template for future malware. This is something that people, uh, smart folks who are out there observing this can use to go and build the next, next round of malware for the world. <coughs> so the thing that I find most amusing about this is the notion that Stuxnet is somehow uh, of, of interest because it crosses the air gap. And so let's spend a few moments on that. What's the air gap principle? The air gap principles in that little green box control system should never, ever interact nor interconnect with any internet systems in any way, shape, or form. The internet's this big ball of unclean, uh, you know, it's cats and porn and who knows what else. Don't connect your control systems to it. Uh, so, this little document, Toward a More Secure Posture for Industrial Control Systems by Paul Ferguson says, in practice and operational terms, physically separating networks is not feasible. 
not going to happen. You're going to try to do it, and then the business guys are going to say, well, how do we get the, the telemetry in order to bill people? Okay, we'll let you in. And then the next round will say, well, how do we get the data from this company to do this, you know, this contractor? Well, we'll let them in before long you've, you've connected everything. Even if we went to the, to the to Siemens code, so they issue guidance on how to build secure systems. Here's their security concept, PCS7 and WinCC. And it lays it all out. It shows you how you, you uh, can connect things, where you should put firewalls, how to build a nice secure system. Where is the air gap? There's no air gap. Everything is connected to everything because that's the way these systems operate. Uh, Sean McGurk, uh, who I think is, may no longer be at DHS, I haven't talked to him in a while, he spoke at a workshop that we ran at the National Lab, and uh, he said this, and then later he said it to, uh, to the Subcommittee on National Security, and he said, in no case, in no case, after hundreds of vulnerability assessments, have they ever found a, a uh, the operations network, the SCADA system, or the energy management system separated from the enterprise network. That it, the air gap is essentially, in his mind, just a myth. Now, I know some folks who work in the nuclear world, and they assure me that, yes, there, there are air gaps in, in nuclear power plants. But, uh, but for the most part, that seems to be the one <laughs> remaining place where you can reliably count on there being uh, an air gap. So, so I'm, I'm surprised so many folks uh, focused on that. Since then, what's happened? Well, in 2011, more hard-coded passwords were found to get a command shell. Replay, this, is, this just entertains me. Uh, you can intercept commands from on these Step 7 uh, software, and you can play them back. And it's, it works across nearly all of them. Uh, you want, if there are, is authentication a problem, we'll go and do the, issue the command to disable authentication, record that, and then play it back. And now authentication is disabled. And it's, that's, that's great. Uh, you want to, uh, you know, and, and, and sessions, once the sessions are established, they never expire. So once the session's open, you can just count on that to continue to replay commands and, and do what do you want to with them. So the, this is great. This gives you a way to do this. Scan the network for devices with port 102 open, and then just start recording data and, and replaying it and sending them information, or use your own uh, setup to generate the commands and play them back. Uh, <coughs> There's lots more. There's a lot more about Stuxnet. If you want to see all the, the, uh, the nice little internals and, and so forth, uh, Liam Mercu uh, and, uh, oh, and, and uh, Eric Chen and, and, and Nicholas wrote this great report, this big thorough report, describes how each piece of, of Stuxnet operates and how it all fits together. It's got you know, good diagrams, so if you want to know, how do I get off of removable media? Well, there's a nice little diagram that illustrates the process of which one so there's a lot of information there. So again, roadmap for future malware authors. If any of you out there are aspiring malware authors, the internet's a great resource to go and, and find this to help you build it. So web, like I said, web's a great resource. So there are lots of things that do vulnerability scanning. There's Nessus, there's Nmap, there's tons of stuff out there that you can run. There's some really neat stuff that's coming out of research labs, places like the University of Illinois and others. Uh, what if someone grabbed that and they ran it over the entire internet? They just said, instead of scanning your network or the university's network, let's just scan the internet. Let's see what we find. And they made the results easily searchable. That would be great. Uh, some people have logins and passwords to your systems and to various systems around the country. What if they had a place where they could go dump those and you could go and search for logins uh, for those? Well, uh, if you're looking for a place that scanned it, uh, uh, Shodan's a good place to go. Uh, you can go in here, you can look for things like default password. You can go and look for things that have port 102 open. This is where you go find that stuff. It's very easily searchable. Once you find it, you might need to get in. Well, uh, turns out people upload stuff to bug me not. This is so you can get into the New York Times, past their paywall and so forth. But uh, people upload other stuff there as well. And it seems like a long shot, uh, but it works. Uh, I think I've done a pretty decent job of blocking out the name of the, of the utility that owns that website. Uh, but uh, if, you just <laughs> if you just go on and search, uh, there's a decent chance you might get, uh, get lucky with some of this. So uh, you know, 
the day I made this slide, I ran it and found something like 4,000 uh, uh, FTP services out there, 3,200 3, uh, stuff in the U.S., so forth. Uh, <coughs> fair amount of, of vulnerable systems. Well, we've had a two years of this being well known and people knowing to check for this. And so I can, having, I ran it just the other day, I meant to make a new slide, but I didn't do it. I ran it just the other day to see how that's changed, right? People know about this, they know to defend against it. Those numbers have gone up. <laughs> it appears to be, uh, it appears that uh, the data is getting into these databases faster than people are, are being good at uh, protecting themselves against it. In fact, there's a little cottage industry now of places where you can go and find out if somebody has, has owned your data. Someone's, has someone. Has your data been released in a data breach? You might want to know, right? So people get usernames and passwords. It might be nice to know if, if the Adobe breach or one of these other ones that's been publicized, was, were my login credentials in that? Should I worry? Because, you know, like most people, I'm sure you, you know, probably use the same password in several different sites. And so compromising ones, tantamount to compromising several. So you can go put your stuff in here and find out if you've been owned. And you might have been. It could have happened, you know, it, it might. Uh, and now there's a little cottage industry where people will watch your email address with these new uh, data breaches, and they'll notify you if you show up in one of these publicly released uh, databases. Uh, doesn't tell you if it's whether or not you've really been compromised because this only looks through the, through the publicly released ones, but it's, it's, uh, it's quite amazing. Uh, I was on the phone at one point with, uh, with a fellow from a company who was uh, talking about this, and while on the phone, I went and searched Shodan, and then I went and searched Bug Me Not, and I was able to give him uh, credentials to a system uh, of his, which was, I think, a, a little bit of a wake-up call. The stuff's out there. It's, you know, if you, you, don't have to, you don't have to look on obscure Russian message boards anymore to find this stuff. You can find this uh, pretty easily, and you should be checking for it. So how do you get in? I mean, all these things exist because out in the world of computing, we've taken the IT stuff, and, and it's great, it's commodity, it works well, it gives you good bandwidth, life is great, you can manage it. A lot of people know a lot about it. And in importing all those good things, we also import all these vulnerabilities. And they come from a number of sources. And, uh, uh, but luckily, people check for them and they get corrected. So let's pick on one vulnerability. So this is, uh, this has the Adobe, the famous Adobe Flash vulnerability that was disclosed. Uh, on June 4th of 2010, uh, Adobe alerted the world that it, it had this vulnerability issued in an advisory. On the 7th, they said, you know what, this is really serious, we're going to push out an update to fix this. Uh, on June 10th, the good folks at Metasploit went out there and they issued, uh, they, they issued a, public rel a reliable public exploit. I can't actually who it was that wrote it. You might remember who it was. Wrote a nice exploit, the last module for Metasploit let you do that. So on June 10th, 2010, anybody with a pulse and the ability to follow directions or follow a YouTube video can now exploit this vulnerability uh, on the machine. On June 14th, Symantec did some analysis and they discovered that this looks like it was part of attacks as far back as 2008. So not 2010, 2009, but back to 2008. So we got to change the scale a little bit. And so here we are. And the point is that from by June 29th, then they released an update, which we know only partially fixed it. So here's the Metasploit becoming available. And so for all this time, it's available for anybody in the world to use. Anybody who wants to use this is free to go and get it and, and make use of it. But the more interesting piece is this piece, which goes from the yellow line, which goes from here all the way back. That is zero day, which in this case, zero day constitutes, what is that, uh, uh, about two and a quarter years. <laughs> so these things live for a long, long, long time. 
the uh, very famous uh, uh, Windows Print School of Vulnerability. That had lived for a long, long time. The authentication stuff that was in there had been around for many, many years. Uh, so zero day doesn't necessarily mean something that just came out and now it's on there. It's been there a long time. And so if you think about this in terms of systems that are, that are very widely deployed and heavily used, and a lot of people are making use of it, you know, commodity PCs and the Adobe software, they're finding this stuff and they're, they're doing pretty good. And then you turn around and you think about systems that are, s that are smaller in scope, less widely distributed, SCADA systems. Uh, you know, we've probably just begun to scratch the surface of the vulnerabilities that are available to exploit in those systems, even with the, the testing that's being done. So why don't we just find this malware and get rid of it? Well, uh, part of the problem is we can't write a perfect universal malware detector. There's this thing that gets in the way of doing that called Rice's Theorem. Uh, and you can, it has a number of different applications, but the, b the gist of Rice's Theorem, which is one of those great theorems in computer science is, anything interesting about software is undecidable. That's, that's basically what the theorem tells you. It tells you that any non-trivial property of the recursive language is undecidable. A property is non-trivial, oh, sorry, sorry. A property is trivial if Every, every one of the languages has it, or none of them has it, have it. That makes it trivial. So those are all uninteresting, because either they all have them or they, none of them have them. It's the ones where some things are this way and some things aren't. Those are the non-trivial ones, and those are undecidable. So in general, uh, you're out of luck. Uh, uh, detecting mal you know, a perfect malware detector that looks at a piece of software and says, is this malware, is equivalent to asking, does it halt for all inputs. So you can't build that. But one thing you can do is you can begin to try to get around this, and I think a lot of organizations are seeing this and doing this now, by observing the behavior. So you can look at what it does. So instead of trying to look at the, at the, the bytes that make up the program, look at the network traffic, you can look at, at essentially the physics of the computation. Like information takes up space. Computation uses up time. It uses up power. You can look at those and try to detect uh, the presence of it. And there's several efforts going on. We have some going on at Oak Ridge. There's some work going on here that's very similar. Uh, and I know there's some stuff going on at a few other places as well. Time consumed by processes on the machine, power transients on the machine, things like that. The, the lesson here is that malware actually makes your machine run slower. And it shouldn't be surprising, right? It has to do some work. It has to actually do some stuff. It has to run a command and control server. It has to take some kind of an action. And all of these things uh, take time and use up resources. But more importantly, uh, most malware, rootkits, intruders, so on, they do something that ordinary programs don't do, which is they attempt to hide their presence. And so they take action to try to modify the OS to hide themselves. So they'll hide themselves in the loaded module table. They'll try to hide their module. Or they'll hide themselves in the process table. Or they'll hide files. Those are unusual activities, and, and observing uh, the time consumed by that uh, can reveal the presence of malware. So we have some, some hope there. Uh, problems have all been solved now. Everything's better. Uh, January this year, uh, ICS third issued this alert, an offline brute force password tool targeting Siemens uh, Step 7. So, uh, now you can go and grab that and start cracking passwords to your heart's content. Uh, uh, so, not been solved. We continue to find vulnerabilities. We continue to find these kinds of issues, and that's because of a couple of things. One is we're, we're importing the vulnerabilities from the IT sector in. We're building new vulnerabilities in, in, in systems that are out there. We have legacy systems that have been around for a long time that have embedded vulnerabilities in them that will continue to be out there for some time. And you know, we're just not doing a great job of finding all that. So I'm going to sum up and talk a little bit about some of the risk involved in this <coughs> and how you, might, how you might try to counter that. So one way to think about this, the way that uh, a number of folks think about it is risk is threats, vulnerabilities, and the consequences of that. So the threat is, could be a person, could be an insider, could be some kind of a circumstance or an event. Uh, some adverse event that you don't want to happen. The vulnerability can be a weakness 
uh, in the system. Cryptographic weaknesses are one example. Maybe a, like MD5 is later found to have a have to be weak to some kinds of attacks. A bug, something just wrong in the software. It doesn't have to be something wrong in the software. Not all vulnerabilities are bugs. Some are just weaknesses. Some are built in on purpose. Uh, that's true of a lot of SCADA systems. People build in back doors to them. That's a vulnerability. And then the consequences, whatever loss or damage occurs. So can we reduce the threat? Well, uh, how do we deal with that? How can we, how can we get that number down? Well, uh, the threat comes from a lot of different different places, and really the only way to deal with that is through intelligence gathering. You have to understand what your people are doing, who can you trust, not trust, who's acting in a trustworthy way, who's not. Uh, uh, you have to collect, and the only way to deal with the threat uh, issue is through intelligence. Vulnerabilities? Well, there's good news, there's a lot we can do here. There's formal methods that will help us out, rigorous analysis, maybe a little, little slightly less formal than pure formal methods. Uh, secure coding techniques. Uh, I know Robert Secord at CERT's written, a, I guess, a couple books now on, uh, on secure coding techniques. And supply chain risk management. One of the nice things about the world is you buy these devices and they're delivered to you. And uh, sometimes they're delivered and they're well configured. And sometimes they're delivered and they're badly configured. Uh, uh, sometimes stuff that you get. You know, it's very difficult. It's a global, it's a global world, global supply chain. Uh, when a box shows up uh, with stuff in it, uh, just knowing where all the pieces came from is quite a challenge. And uh, I know some organizations that do a really good, good job of supply chain management, and some organizations that don't do any of it at all. Uh, but that's one of the best ways to reduce, uh, reduce your vulnerability. <coughs> consequences. Can we reduce the consequences? I mean, if we can make any one of these things go down to zero, we're probably in good shape. Uh, can we reduce the consequences? Well, uh, there's a, there are techniques for increasing the resiliency of systems, designing them so they're more resilient, designing systems so they are survivable. I tend to separate those two concepts, uh, survivability and resiliency. And, and one, of the nice, one of the nice things about some of the, some of the SCADA systems we talk about is there are places where you can rely on the physics of the system uh, to protect you. There are just certain system states you should never enter because they're dangerous. And, uh, and there are often mechanical or physical ways uh, to augment the system and prevent, uh, prevent getting into that. Sometimes that's costly because it's hardware. A lot of times, uh, I think that the, the dominant trend in the last probably uh, 20 years of my life has been to observe uh, physical interconnects and interlocks being removed and replaced with software. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's because software is cheap, it's inexpensive, I throw this, this instead I take these you know, simple physical systems with known failure modes out of the system and I put this incredibly complicated control, uh, this software control system in its place and, uh, and that's great because it reduces my cost, it maybe, maybe uh, increases the warranty time for the device, things like that, uh, but, uh, but it, you know, it just creates a a system that's, that's it's more exploitable. I've introduced something in there that's much more complicated and whose failure mode I don't necessarily understand fully. Uh, all right. Thank you very much. It takes me to the end. Uh, I'm happy to address any questions you have. What questions do you have for me? Uh, thank you, Stacy. So, Tim Yardley, University of Illinois. Um, the uh, the Stuxnet case is just one example of of a malware approach, and obviously, you know your your expertise is is at, at Oak Ridge is in that area of of detecting malware and, and other aspects. Can you talk a little bit about some of the work at, at Oak Ridge that uh, that could be used to, um, to detect or to prevent uh, uh, attacks like Stuxnet, for instance? So we've done a, we did a, a, a few things related to this. One thing that we did uh, fairly uh, early on was uh, we. Uh, looked at, can I, uh, so we've got these PLCs around the, in the world, and maybe infected machines, you're plugging them into these, to the infected machine, and now it's reading the stuff off the PLC, and, uh, and you're seeing the good stuff, you write the stuff back on, it adds the malware, and you're, you're back where you were. And so early on, we did some, some devices that just did uh, PLC auditing. So you just walk out with a handheld device, plug it in, it would dump the PLC memory, and, you, and give you uh, 
a couple checksums over that that you can compare to what you were seeing on the PC. Really dumb, simple stuff, but it would have it, it certainly would have would have found this. Uh, more recently, we spent quite a bit of effort on that behavioral side that I talked about. So we spent uh, quite a bit of effort looking at uh, at what does malware first? What do root kits do to hide themselves? So we grabbed a number of modern root kits, uh, dug through whatever analysis we could find of them, and and took a look at what they try to modify in the in the kernel or in the OS. They modify things to hide their presence or to prevent them from being detected. Uh, and the modifications are typically far more costly than the original operation. So an example I can pick on is the loaded module table for Linux. I go grab that, and then I want to walk through the module table. That's a pretty fast operation. I'm basically just bumping a pointer and, and moving through the table. With malware in place, we've seen malware that, that actually will do a string compare to see if you're looking at its module. That's an incredibly costly operation that immediately uh, increases the cost of doing that, uh, walking through the module table. We've seen uh, uh, malware that interferes with, uh, with the read and write uh, uh, on, the, on the machine. We've seen malware that, uh, that interferes with the process table. And so you look for those kinds of things. You very precisely, or as precisely as you can on the machine, measure the time consumed by them, and then you look for, for anomalies in that. And so what we've done with our Beholder project, which actually uh, does this work, we collect, inf we identify this a collection of what we call critical routines. We instrument them so we can precisely measure their time. We do that with several different time sources. And we collect the data, we compute the time differences, we compute on the device uh, a distance, a set of distance measures, and we transmit those remotely to a server. The server then uh, uses the distance measures to try to tell if, you, if your machine has undergone a phase change. I mean, are we seeing the same thing we were seeing before? Or are we seeing the machine now operating in a, in a, different, uh, a different state? And detecting that, uh, then we use that to detect the, to, to, uh, detect the presence of, of malware. So if the machine quits transmitting its information, that's a bad sign. You should do something about that. If the information transmitted is far out of bound, we'll detect that. You should do something about that. Or if it's indicative of an infection because it's spending too much time in certain operations, we'll, we'll detect that. So it's remote detection. We don't try to do the detection on the device itself because we're assuming the device itself may get owned. Uh, and uh, we do the detection using a, a uh, rather unusual method. We use a nonlinear method for doing phase-based analysis uh, and, and trying to find that. It was originally developed for actually predicting epileptic seizures, of all things. Uh, but it's, uh, it turned out to be quite effective at that. We've used it for forewarning of failure in bridges, and now we're using it to, uh, to detect phase-based changes uh, on the machine data. And the, the nice thing about it is it doesn't require any training to, to do that. Uh, there's been some quite a bit of work on static analysis as well. We do, we, that's sort of a, an area of expertise for us is deep static analysis of programs. So we do a lot of binary analysis uh, to, to inform that. A question from online. Can you discuss any of the, qu the quantum key distribution approaches being developed at ORNL? Oh, uh, you should have someone else here to discuss that. So that would be, that would be Raphael Pruser or Warren Dreis or, or one of those. Uh, but yeah, there are some, I know there are some novel approaches to quantum key, to, uh, to quantum key distribution that are being worked on. Uh, uh, one of them being uh, methods for multicast. Uh, distributing, distributing these keys is, is you know, between, a, between an Alice and Bob is okay, but when you start adding several other parties, it becomes quite challenging. Uh, and so I know there's been some work on, on how can I do uh, multicast, how can I distribute keys to a large number of people so they can each communicate pairwise among themselves. Uh, and I believe there's actually a DOE funded effort on that right now. Uh, there's been some work in, uh, on that in collaboration with a couple of private companies. Uh, but I am not the person to, to go into any more depth than I just did. <laughs> uh, so, Stacy Tim Yardley again. The, uh, um, th there's a, a big gap between being able to detect malware, and as you said, um, Rice's theorem indicates that you can't really um, create a perfect anti-malware solution. Right. Um, where do you see this research or where do you see this sector going to prevent against these zero day attacks since this presentation was on behalf of the cyber warfare research okay. team you know <laughs> we have to defend ourselves uh, from from these types of of issues right um so if we can't develop tech 
technology that can actually detect the malware um, in an anti-malware sort of way that is complete. How do you foresee us being able to protect ourselves from these emerging threats that will be targeted? So, uh, so I, so I, I so Ryzen System tells me I can't write a program that tells me if another program is uh, is malware. And so, you know, thus the way to get around it, one of the ways to get around it is to is to rely on the physics, like we are with looking at timing and so on. That takes a, a you know, that measures another property outside the scope of the program itself to look for malware. So that's that's uh, the way of doing it. Uh, Developing much more robust and resilient systems, vulnerability, vulnerability analysis, that, that is all extremely good and helpful stuff that is really just now beginning to become uh, real and practicable. I mean, a, a, a vulnerability analysis consists <laughs> largely of looking for bad, uh, you know, signatures of bad stuff in code right now, as opposed to rather you know, the, the deeper kind of, of semantic analysis that needs to be done to find uh, some of these vulnerabilities, so that needs that needs to progress, uh, and and so it's really a, a question. I guess it really comes back down to this question of reducing the risk, and that has to do with, you know, can I eliminate the threat? Well, probably not. Can I reduce the consequences uh, to people compromising devices? Can I just accept that people are going to compromise these devices, but uh, but reduce the, their ability to do harm once they do? Uh, we've got uh, a little bit of early stage work where we, uh, you know, one of the things with Beholder is, so we put it on your machines and we tell you, ah, ah, this thing right here, this has been infected. So that's, quest so question one was, what's infected? So we tell you, this has been infected. Question two is, what do we do about that? Do we turn this off? Well, suppose it's a router that accesses a substation, you're for low, let's say lower Manhattan. You're not going to turn it off. <laughs> You're going to keep using it. You want to keep using it, but you want to deny the adversary the ability to, to do bad things. And so we're, we're looking at, uh, at trusted operations, uh, systems where the machine itself uh, can go into a state where it will not execute a command unless it's, unless you, it's given a brand new uh, cryptographic key that allows you to execute that command. Uh, so there's some trusted operation issues even when you're you know, sort of the fight through approach, even when you've been compromised. Yeah. Yes. Um, so you, you mentioned a lot about uh, reducing the damage of things. Um, so we, my research is in forensics. We kind of are assuming that these compromises do happen. Um, yeah, they do. Basically <laughs> kind of trying to detect that something's gone wrong at all. Then secondarily, if, if after that fact, then trying to figure out what has gone wrong. Mm -hmm. um, basically, where, where do you see uh, forensics coming into all of this? And what are your hopes where that might go in the future? So we don't do, we don't do a huge amount of forensics at the lab. We do some we've done some binary uh, forensic work in that we take uh, we take fragments. So uh, suppose you get a, a piece of media that's captured by let's say the FBI or someone they hand it to you. Uh, there are a variety of things you can do to say oh this is part of an image, this is part of a sound file, this is this is part of this. Uh, as for binaries, that's a somewhat somewhat harder problem to say well this binary was this was part of Microsoft Word, so ignore it. But this is part of of this bad thing over here, we have a we had a, 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 a project that we ran for two years called Concordia, and it was uh, just basically a a, a a big machine learning project looking at binary fragments. So we take a piece of code and we slice it up into what we call wood chips. So we divide it up into the three byte, four byte, five byte sequences. Just any just uh, any length. We throw them all in there. We identify the ones that are just identical because they're the same bytes. Okay, those are all great. And we merge the information about those chips, where they came from, what program they're a part of. We then uh, figure out what they do, and we merge the ones that are semantically identical, as the best we can tell. And we merge the information about them. And we say, well, this came from, you know, this, this particular functionality is found in these various places. <coughs> then we, we seed this with you know, known good and known bad programs. So we, there's, a, there's a period of, of uh, what I guess I'll call supervised learning, where you put in these things, you say, this is labeled data, these are good, these are bad, and you put them in there. And then you take an unknown program. You take something that you don't know whether it's good or bad, and you uh, wood chip it the same way. You, uh, you uh, cluster it with the rest of this, and you see where it goes. The, the idea that led to this was, uh, Suppose I just have fragments of the program. I need to figure out where those things go 
uh, in here. Or even suppose I have the entire program. What I might have, if I just cluster on the program itself, it may look very much like the executable for Microsoft Word. And so it'll cluster over here with that. But in reality, only a tiny portion of it is bad stuff. And so what I need to do is break it up so that I can see that this portion clusters over here with the bad stuff, whereas this clusters with the word processor. Uh, so we, like I said, we did two years of that work. Uh, we came to the realization that it's also helpful if you have, uh, if in addition to the labeled data, you put unlabeled data in there as well, because it helps to find the space a little better. Uh, and, uh, and did that work? delivered it. We've since been deploying it on our own malware uh, repository and doing some, some classification on that. Uh, it's been used, uh, I think it's been used a couple of times in some forensic investigations, uh, but that's basically the only, only piece of forensics that we've ever really looked at is, is you know, let's what can we do with these binary fragments? has a lot of applications because it can help you find bad stuff or, or, or uh, or classify unknown stuff. So I, um, this is Clara Nashtet, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. I have a question about cost. <laughs> In your particular equation, risk basically is proportional to the uh, threads and the vulnerabilities and uh, the sort of consequences. But somehow you did not really have uh, uh, sort of the inverse proportion to the cost or, or sort of how do you currently see in this risk cost? Because very often we hear security and cost basically are biting each other. <laughs> well, we have, uh, uh, we have a fair amount of work on, on uh, let me get the acronym right before I, before I uh, uh, say it. Um, I'm not going to the acronym. We have a, a, uh, a project that, that looks at the, the you surveys of stakeholders. We collect information, and we use that uh, to inform a model. We basically build a set of matrices. Uh, we do some computations over it, and, uh, and we get back a, a, a total cost. Uh, Cybersecurity Econometrics System, CSES, is the, the upgrade acronym. I finally remembered it. Uh, <coughs> it's difficult to quantify the cost of a vulnerability. Uh, the folks who work on CSES have put a lot of time and thought into things like independence and how can I, how can I identify parts of the model that are independent so that I can do the computations to get the cost. Uh, but even so, I stay pretty skeptical that you can truly know the, the cost associated with a vulnerability. I think you can, you can get a pretty good handle on the cost associated with an event, with a, with a data loss event or an intrusion event. I think you can, even that's a little fuzzy, but I think you can get a pretty good handle on that. But in terms of, of figuring out what the cost for a particular threat uh, or a particular vulnerability is, I think that's quite challenging. You can know something about the threat of a consequence, about the cost of a consequence, but, but, but that's kind of it. Now the, the, the CSES model, uh, like I said, it uses information from a variety of stakeholders. It uses uh, information about prior events. And, and it's, but its main purpose is to inform you as to trade-offs. So if you have three or four different things you can go in and do, I can change to this other hardware firewall that's better in some way. I can change a password policy over here. I can, I can implement two-factor authentication. These are things I can do, but I don't have unlimited funds. And so I've got to pick one. Which one is the highest payoff to me? You can use this model to give you uh, information that tells you which one, <coughs> which one, based on the assumptions behind the model, uh, is the best one to do the, do the cost-benefit trade-off. And it's, uh, it's the it's typical stuff you might think, right? It's net present value calculations and, and that to do that work. Uh, I think that's important. It's a world of limited resources. Uh, and, but you have, to, you have to acknowledge that when you make these, as you make these trade-offs, uh, there is a huge amount you don't know about them, right? Let's say you, just say you decide, I'm going to go with two-factor authentication. That's the approach I'm going to take. And a month later, there is the data breach at RSA. Okay, great. We didn't know about that in advance. That couldn't be in the model. Maybe you should have done something different. 
it's a, this is a very challenging field to get your arms around the, the true costs and benefits. And so uh, all we can do is this is a, is a best effort approach, I think. Uh, another question from online. What static analysis tools are you using for deep semantic analysis? So we have, uh, 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 so we use a few that are out in the world, we, but uh, for the most part, we have our own. We have a system called Hyperion. Uh, it's based on, on a method called function extraction. We take the binary. We, uh, so I'll tell you the just so story, and then I'll tell you uh, the parts in which I lied. Uh, so we take the binary, we disassemble it, we uh, structure it, turn it into a structured program, we annotate all the leaves with, uh, with the, the uh, mathematical function for the instruction, so each leaf is in a machine instruction, and then we use the, the, uh, the structured control flow to populate those up and get an end-to-end -end function for the whole program. That, look, that was also something called a behavior catalog. The sequence of all the behaviors the program exhibits and the conditions under which it exhibits each one. So that's the just so story. So uh, you can't just do that. You can't just take a static disassembly uh, and go from there. First, you don't necessarily know where the code is. It's hard to figure out which parts of, of a program are code and which are not. Uh, and so we use an iterative method to do that. We go to the entry point, uh, which are pretty reliable, pretty reliably gets executed and we begin to, to follow our nose from there, computing as we go. Uh, we can't just, you can't, you know, you can't just start with the static flow. You have, to you have to figure that out. You have to figure out which parts of it are analyzed. A single pass disassembly will not work, for, especially not for malware. <coughs> we don't just compute the end-to-end -end function for an entire program because that's not necessarily something that's interesting and valuable. Suppose I gave you the behavior catalog for Microsoft Word in terms of machine operations, memory modification, register assignments, and so forth. That would, that would be useless to you. We want is useful, actionable information. And so we typically uh, don't go all the way up to the end-to-end uh, -end function for it. We identify external, external events, external function calls, inputs, outputs, and we express the behavior in terms of those. We then get to higher levels by uh, expressing patterns of these. So we say, well, you here are these external function calls, this, this, this behavior that's going on, uh, this, uh, you know, this pattern or this pattern or this pattern, they all yield a, a situation in which you're, you are uh, masquerading as a different user. You've changed your user ID. So we can express that. We can then run it over a program and determine if that program exhibits that behavior and, and where it does. And then we can express higher level behavior in terms of lower level behavior all the way up so we can uh, build higher and higher level uh, behavior specifications and, and, and compute on them and find those pretty quickly in programs. And, and that's our approach to, to uh, static analysis. So you mentioned uh, some very sophisticated things like Stuxnet and malware. Um, have you done any research into things where you might be able to detect these things in the wild? So like they've, they've broken in your system. You have these sophisticated things with layers of rootkits and levels of complexity. How do you, how do you hope we can, find, we can detect these things if they've gotten in the future? So I mentioned the timing analysis. Uh, I didn't mention that we had, uh, I did this at, at CERT, I think. We did some work on, on space analysis. So you watch memory allocations, you watch disk activity, and, uh, and you, you uh, do normal stuff on the machine. You, then you install normal software on the machine, and then you install malware on the machine. And the question is, does malware behave uh, in, in space in a way that's different from other kinds of programs? And, and our experiments indicated that, yeah, you can, you can tell that malware is doing something that's a little bit weird compared to what normal programs are doing. We also, uh, uh, I wasn't involved in it, but uh, Lean Pouchard and a few other researchers did some work at Oak Ridge looking at, uh, at can I detect the presence of these rootkits by looking at, at power, at power consumption. And, uh, and I have to admit, I thought they were sort of crazy because they were looking on the AC side, and I said, you've got this big low-pass filter between you and the data, you'll never see anything. Uh, but in fact, they were able to uh, to see uh, the power consumption change uh, once you had once malware was on the machine. It was simply consuming more power. Uh, so there are there are approaches like that, that that rely on the physics of computation to detect these things. And if, especially if you've got layers of, of sophisticated malware on there doing complex things, running a Lua virtual machine, right? That's that's going to consume a lot more resources than just running a few commands. 
Uh, some of these were in fairly sophisticated command and control servers. Some of them do network surveillance. These are all actions taken in the physical world that are detectable. And I think that's where you have to go to, to find these things. Let me ask, this is an interesting point. Uh, Frank Borth says, the systems in traditional generation plants up until even recently have had uh, pneumatic, hydraulic, mechanical type systems. Now even the oldest plants to compete must improve their response by replacing these older, less responsive systems with new microprocessor systems. The result is that processes which were inherently safe previously are now partially or completely vulnerable. Yeah. And often vendors, integrators do not advise the buyer of these new problems. They want their new systems to appear totally better. But in the end, the plants do not get the message and are in jeopardy without even knowing it or how naked they really are. Uh, how are we going to advise these people when they are not getting the message through normal channels? Yeah, it's, it's really disturbing when you take a system, a physical system, a pneumatic control or something like that, and you do an FMEA analysis on it and you say, here are the ways in which this thing can fail. Here's the effects of these failures. And I can do this and I give you this if it's on a piece of paper and now I know what my risk is. And I take that and replace it with a, a networked control system based on these computing devices. And I can't do that analysis anymore. I'm really sort of out of luck on that. Uh, I don't know how to get the message to these folks. Uh, I just simply don't, don't know. Uh, it seems like we're spreading, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're spreading the vulnerabilities far more, far far quicker than we're dealing with them uh, appropriately. We're spreading these systems out into the world, enabling insecurity, if you will, by doing this. And I, I just don't know. I used to use, a, many years ago, I used an example uh, back when I was teaching uh, product engineering. I would use uh, an example of a uh, microwave. So microwave has a little metal, little, little uh, contact switch in the door. Uh, you you open it, the switch opens, cuts power to the, to the tube. Uh, you close it, that closes the switch. Uh, power can flow to the tube, et cetera. Very simple system. How is that system going to fail? Well, the switch is going to break, which results in the switch being open, which means that bad, the bad thing of opening the door with the tube on doesn't happen. The, the, the other bad thing is that the micro doesn't work at all. <laughs> but that's OK, right? You figure out how long it takes to fatigue that switch, how uh, uh, how many times people open it and close it during a day on average, and you figure out that tells you what your warranty ought to be, right? The device is under warranty for this period, now it's gone out of warranty and the switch fails and, and life's okay. Uh, I used to use that example and I finally got called on it by someone who said, we don't do it that way anymore. It's, it is a software interconnect now. So we detect the doors closed and we inform the software and we shut it off that way. So that was a mildly disturbing event to me. <laughs> Uh, the systems can be made safe, I think. They can be made, made secure, uh, but it's, a, it's quite a challenge to do so. And investing the effort to do it, uh, I think there's not a lot of will to do it. Because doing all of that work requires a huge investment in terms of, of, of rigorous analysis of these systems and careful implementation that, that people don't want to do. I mean, maybe you spend time building a careful specification for, the, for a system, for a protocol, for a piece of software. And you, you build that in a formal way, and you do all this analysis of it, and you conclude that this is good. If you build this system, it's going to meet the properties we need for this control system. And then you use the pizza model to build the software. And you know, the pizza model is you get some grad students, and you put them in a room, and you slide a pizza under the door, and they write code. And, uh, and out comes the code. And uh, then you test it, right? You do some functionality testing and some acceptance testing. And you say it looks good, and you ship it out into the world. And, uh, and there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a point in that process that's broken. And it's, 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 you know, it's not necessarily the pizza part of it. It's that uh, there's no connect between uh, the, the, the real safety and security requirements that occur up front and the end product, it's my opinion. So we're, we're about out of time here, Stacy. but uh, I'm going to make one last comment before thanking you, which is since you have the risk slide up, um, we've seen an evolution in, in the definition of risk by entities and how businesses start uh, managing that. So looking at like the ISO 27000 series, for instance, yeah. 
Um, the 2005 edition of that used the Plan Do Check Act um, cycle to to address risk and and implement the ISMIS or ISMS rather. Um, and then in 2013, they said, uh, well, maybe we need to be more active and monitor um, the performance of of the plan, et cetera. So I think you know as we move forward with with research and as we move forward with implementation, the you know, the question that all utilities need to answer is, well, what is my risk from this and how am I going to, to address that from a business process? And as you've seen the evolution and ISA 99 being based on that, um, indicating that, that, well, it's based on monitoring. So detection of these things and being able to actually um, see how well your, your mitigations are performing is important, which gets us to the security quantification and other discussion. And that's still an area that we all have to work in. Right. Um, so not looking for a response, but, uh, but I wanted to thank you for, for your presentation and, and uh, thank you for visiting us here at TCIPG. And uh, stay tuned for our, for our next seminar. Um, which will which will be coming up, and uh, so everyone, please thank uh, Dr. Stacy Prowell.